We're going to continue on with uh, image processing ideas. Last time we used filtering to clean up my little cappuccino cup. So that was pretty cool. Now we're going to talk about other methods that exist for doing this kind of stuff. Um, actually, what we're going to really focus on today is, is maybe not so much denoising. It's going to be sort of uh, image smoothing. Okay, So you have a little bit of stuff there. You just want to smooth it out, make it look nice. We're going to talk about some of the techniques for doing this. Um, and here's the way to think about it. I have an image. I don't know. If we're in the Northwest, there it is. It's like an outdoor scene. And if you're in New York, you might go, that's boring. That's like big buildings, supermodels. OK? So it all depends on what you like. So and you want to. Maybe you have a little graininess. You'd like to smooth that out a little bit. Okay, touch it up. Okay. Um, so how do you do this? Well, one way to think about the image is a collection of pixels. And this is what we did last time, which is this here. Who cares what it is? It's some data. U has a function of x and y. You have pixelated images, and you just want to say, I want to do something with this to process this. And this is what we did last time. We Fourier transform an image. So we thought about it in a very different way. Not in a visual context, but once you put it in the Fourier domain, it has some representation in wave number space. And the wave number space basically says, hey, there are features at certain wavelengths that has then a signature in the Fourier domain at those wavelengths. OK. So it gives us this idea that this can be thought of as an, in a more general way. But it doesn't have to be an image. It can be data. It can be raw data that you're trying to process, clean up, denoise. That's what we did last time. So now what I talk about is say, OK, now if I, as long as I'm starting to think along that direction, that you, this image field, is really just a collection data, then I can just start, let's manipulate it. Let's start doing things to it that you wouldn't normally think of if you're just thinking about it as an image. And in particular, there's one kind of partial differential equation that people know about, known as the diffusion equation. In its simplest form, here it is. Ut equals del squared u, where del squared is 2 derivatives of x, 2 derivatives of y. It's called the heat equation, or diffusion equation. So why do we introduce it here? The one thing we know about the heat equation or the diffusion processes, is that if you start off with sort of choppy data, the one thing that this thing does is it smooths things, okay, almost instantaneously, okay? So you have sharp edges, you have lots of, this thing just smooths it all out. Well, isn't that what we want to do with our image? We want to take something that's grainy, has a little sharp spikes or things like this that we want to remove. Why don't we just take this image, u, x, and y, and diffuse it? Whoa. <laughs> Did you hear that? That was like right on cue. We're going to diffuse images. So that's the idea. Now let's talk a little bit about the theory of this, because you'll see there's already a connection to something we know, which is one way to think about solving such a problem is let me first write it out. this thing. Actually, let me do the following. Let me put a generic diffusion coefficient in here, d. Okay, And it's uxx plus uyy. All right. So first, we're going to Fourier transform this thing in x. Okay. Now, one of the most important properties about the Fourier transform, OK, part of it is that it takes everything to the frequency domain. But one of the most important things about the Fourier transform, here's our, our little aside about Fourier transform. The Fourier transform of the nth derivative of a function is related to the Fourier transform of the function itself by just putting i k, which are the wave numbers, to the nth power. We derive this in class. Lecture number four. I believe it was. Okay? That's an important property. Why? Because now when we want to think about solving this problem, we're going to use this property. 
we're in a Fourier transform in X. So hat will be the Fourier transform in X. Tilde will be the Fourier transform in Y. So Fourier transform in X first. Time and space are independent, so this just becomes u hat t is equal to d. What happens to u x x? Fourier transforming two derivatives. Two derivatives come out as i k squared. <coughs> i squared is negative 1. So this becomes minus k x squared u hat. x and y are two independent variables. Fourier transforming uiy, since y and x are independent, this just becomes, well, that's just a Fourier transform. You have two derivatives in y. Step number one is done. Step number two, what are you going to do next? No, I'm not going to juggle. I'm going to Fourier transform in y. Were you hoping I was going to juggle? You weren't sure. I don't have anything to juggle. I don't have anything to juggle. I could juggle your coffee cup. Okay, might be hard. I've never seen that. These guys who ju you know juggle chainsaws and flaming knives, let's have them juggle half-empty coffee cup. Let's see how that works out for them. I don't think it would work out well. Boy transforming y. Hat tilde t is equal to d minus kx squared u hat tilde. Now, boy transforming y. It's two derivatives. Pulls out uh, ky squared minus ky squared. Now, since we don't like necessarily writing hats and tildes all over, let's say that u hat tilde is just big U. And this thing becomes big U of t is equal to minus d kx squared plus ky squared. There. The idea behind the Fourier transform and some of its power is the fact that, oh, look at that. I got a first order ODE. It's very simple. And I can write down the solution to this. Is it getting too far down on the board here? Should I? Okay. The solution to this is, let me write it over here. U is equal to Okay, there's the solution. U is equal to U naught, some initial condition, e to the i, or e to the negative d, kx squared plus ky squared t. Simple, simple solution. Now, here are the things to notice. U naught is actually you take your initial conditions and you Fourier transform them. What does that correspond to? You take your image. Whatever that picture happens to be that you're trying to smooth, you take that image and you Fourier transform it. We already have done this, right? Okay, so that's that. And you multiply by this Gaussian. Hey, wait a minute. Didn't we kind of already do this? That's what we did. Last time we filtered with a Gaussian. That's just a Gaussian. And before, when we filtered with the Gaussian, we got to determine the strength of the filtering. Do you remember this sigma parameter, how wide it was? In class, that, so, so d times t was kind of like our sigma that we played around with. So essentially, if you do straight Gaussian filtering, it's equivalent to doing diffusion. Okay. Now, what are the advantages of, so, so part of you could say, well, why would you do diffusion versus just filtering this thing? Uh, here's why. This gives you this idea that this is kind of acting like a filter. But when we come back to here, we can always say, that's a nice concept. Diffusion is like filtering. But here's one thing I know about my image. I wear ties. No, okay. no not my image. Let's say just generic images. Let's come back over to here. And suppose in my image, there's a particular area where I got a lot of noise, for whatever reason. Everything else looks great. 
I don't want to smooth the whole picture. I just have a problem spot. Okay? It's getting older. It's tough. It's all right. You all be there maybe one day. Maybe you're lucky. Maybe you won't have the problem spot. Okay. All right. I only have one area where I need to do some work on this image. Okay? I'm missing some pixels. Whatever I'm missing. Pixels, hair, whatever. If I'm missing stuff here, I do not have to go with this whole if I filter, I'm going to filter the whole thing. That's really tough. Here, spatially, I want to filter one spot. So, for instance, in the diffusion picture, I can start saying, let's come back to here and reconsider this. Here I said the diffusion is going to be constant over the whole domain. But really, I can rewrite this whole thing as the following. For instance, this is a diffusion equation where the diffusion coefficient depends upon where you are in x and y. So for instance, if we consider the image I was just talking about, we can pick how this diffusion behaves locally in our image space. So back to this picture, I could say, you know what, if that's the only problem, I could kind of like, you know, draw a box around this region. I could make d equals 0 everywhere around here. There is no diffusion out there. I don't want to diffuse it. The image is fine over there. All I want to do is look at this area, smooth it out. All right? For instance, you can make d 0 here and d some other constant here, or make it any function you want. So what this really allows you to do, the filtering is, is very harsh in the sense it's a global piece of information. I'm going to look at the whole picture, and I have no option of localizing it in space and time. By the way, isn't this the whole deal with time and frequency analysis? When you Fourier transform a time signal, yes, you get all the Fourier components. You have no idea about where they happened in time. It's the same thing here. When you Fourier transform the image, yes, you have all the frequency content, but you have no idea about, hey, this frequency content actually corresponds to that piece of information spatially here. It doesn't tell you that. You've lost all that information by going to the Fourier domain. Time frequency tells you where you are. It tries to give you sort of information in between. Okay? So same thing here. The diffusion allows you to use knowledge of your problem to do a little bit of, let's call it, essentially, This is a little bit Gaborish, right? Gabor says, go filter in time so I can get time frequency information. If I know what I want to do in my image, essentially I can pick out that dxy to give me some nice information where I want the information. Okay? Did a little time out here real quick. By the way, uh, let's talk about homework three for a moment. Uh, many of you are constructing spectrograms. But what I've noticed, many of you don't realize what you're actually constructing. Yes, you're making cool pictures. Here's time frequency. Do you know that you're actually producing the score of that song? What's the score? Well, OK. I don't know. Who took music? How many bars am I supposed to have? Five, is that right? Five. Yeah, middle C is somewhere. Close enough? And then say, oh, anyway, whatever. You know, what does sheet music tell you to do? Whole notes. I'm a composer now. Do you see that? I composed a song. And we'll put some words to it. That'd be awesome. Okay. This is what? That's a spectrogram. It tells you when and at what frequency you play your music. You could plot that on a p-color. This is what you're constructing in your homework, by the way, right? Uh, I should have done this differently. I should have told you, by the way, middle C is this many hertz. Put bars on there and tell me what the construct a score. Maybe that's a good final. So a group of you might want to do a project where you can like, read in an ACDC song and, and put nice shoot music to it so we can all play it, like with harmonicas and stuff. Okay. 
Do you understand that? That's what you can. Hold, anyway, I just want to throw that out there because a lot of you work in homework, producing cool plots. You're going, ah, well, yeah, it's kind of cool. It's a little messy, uh, but it's fine. It's, it's giving me stuff. You're producing this. Okay. Ultimately, you could reproduce the whole sheet music. If you had the whole song, you could read it through, and you could invert the problem, and you could say, hey, there's this really nice song. I wonder if I could get the sheet music. You can make it yourself just with your computer. By the way, dang, I didn't bring it. My iPhone, super sweet. There's an app called Shazam. What does Shazam do? Hey, I like that song playing. I mean, this is how awesome this technology is, stuff like this, right? You, you push the music, you hold it up, it listens to it for like 10 seconds. You could even be at Starbucks and all these people are talking, waste time. They're like interfering and creating white noise, but you just hold it up there, listens to the song for like 10 seconds. You wait a little bit, boom, pulls out the song for you. It takes, makes basically some kind of transformation of what the song is, right? And it compares to a catalog. It says, hey, yeah, there we go. It's uh, this song by this person. It's pretty, it's amazingly accurate. I don't have anybody, if you, well, if you've got the iPhone, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Those of you who are not so privileged like Matt, Matt, you have the droid, right? Does the droid have Shazam? I like to think of Matt as my charity case. <laughs> uh, you know, when people go, what are you doing good for the world? <laughs> right here. What, what else do you need to know? Anyway. All right. Okay. Uh, so everybody good with that? That was a little time out, time frequency. We're all good with that. That's, that's, uh, that's what you're doing in your homework. So just to, you have like the big picture. So that, so that way you feel the motivation in your work. That's what I'm aiming for. Now we get back to this. And part of the reason I talked about this is because ultimately, with diffusion, you have a lot more flexibility than filtering. Okay? So people work pretty hard on figuring out how to do this. By the way, you don't have to do linear diffusion. You can also say, hey, why don't I make this D? I can also make it some function. of you itself. So it becomes nonlinear diffusion. And actually, people worked hard on this because you can actually pick out some nonlinear diffusive terms that actually help you keep edges around. Okay? So in other words, you want to smooth stuff off. It's not clear you want to destroy your edges, right? Edges are important features in images. There's no doubt about that. You'd like to smooth variations off, but you, you might like to keep your edges. Straight up diffusion just smooths edges. You can pick nonlinear coefficients here that will actually give you retain a lot of your edge information. Yeah, Richard. Are you trying to figure out how this is different than filtering? Because the filtering you could say if it's an entire 600 bytes in the picture, you're taking this piece, they're going to go and you know do the fast Fourier transform, apply the filter to it, and then transform it back. How's I mean, and then you could also use as your D over there nonlinear function as well. Um, so yes, you could. You could use a nonlinear function here to filter. The, the, again, the problem with it is once you in Fourier space. Let's go to my coffee cup example, right? It, was, it looks something like this. It's Fourier spectrum, and I say I want to filter nonlinearly here. But you don't know if I filter some piece here. Where does that correspond to in my actual x y space? Right, because you've lost now information. This is the com full components of all your original image in X, Y space. But if you're looking to localize somewhere in the image itself, you don't know if you filter here nonlinearly where it's coming back here. Now, it could be you're looking more generically. Like, all I want to do is filter to try to keep good, edge, good edges. Then you could probably build this to do this, because there are certain signatures that edges do that you could potentially put in here. But if you're trying to do something local, if you're trying to do x, y cleanup, that you know you're looking for very specific features to take care of, then here, once you've gone to this domain, you don't know where this is in here until you. Could you just crop the Fourier transform? Yes, you could crop. Yeah, so if you want to do that, you could crop an image here and then filter there. That's, I think, what you're asking partly, right? OK. Yeah. So again, very Gaborish, right? Gaborish, because you're just taking out 
a window of your picture. And again, you lose all the long frequency stuff, but you retain some information. So you can imagine even doing image processing by just taking Gabor windows across this whole thing. By the way, wavelets, that's what they do, essentially. Wavelets takes the image, says, give me all the frequency components on the big scale. Now, let's look at patches. What are the frequency components on the patches? And then go to smaller patches. If you look at the wavelet toolbox, there's these level of decompositions of an image. And all it is is chop up, the, chop up the domain. Start off with a big domain. Chop it, chop it, chop it. And you can just get the different resolutions. So. You go and use the diffusion? Uh, you lose the high frequency when you do the, the diffusion. Okay, so if you're using that, you lose both of the high frequency and the low frequency because you're taking a piece. Yeah. And that's why this method's better. Well, <laughs> better is an interesting concept in image processing. I don't think anybody agrees with what that means. It all depends on what your image has and what you're trying to do with it. If you're trying to do edge detection, you have to think carefully about what better means versus if you're just trying to denoise, you have to, there's a very different definition of better. Okay? It's just like real life. It's all in that gray region of what's better really mean, and you have to contemplate it. Terrible. All right. So let's get back to business, back to the lecture at hand. Does anybody know where that's from? Perfection is perfection, so I'm glad you understand. No? Yeah, exactly. That's some Dr. Dram dropping on you right there. It's terrible you guys don't know that. I don't know how you're going to pass this class. Because that's going to be on the final. All right, let's talk about this diffusion. Let's consider uh, 1D. And let's talk about how to do, solve this diffusion equation. Um, so I have two derivatives there. Now what ends up happening is typically when you solve something, you're going to chop it up onto a domain. U is a function of x. And you're going to look at points on this domain and say, hey, what's, hey, by the way, this is just like an image, isn't it? Your image is a collection of pixels. That's your, discreti your discretization in an image is just how many pixels do I have? In that coffee cup example, I have 600 by 800. That is my grid, computational grid. We're going to think of the image as a computational grid. But 1D, I have something, and I say, how do I calculate the second derivative there in x? Well, finite differences gives you a very nice formula for this. Two derivatives in x, all I have to do is say I take Let's do the following. Let's define u of n as value of u at the x of nth point. Okay, so that's maybe the nth point. That's my value u of n. And the way that this works is you say, okay, the second derivative at u of n is equal to a point in front minus twice the current point, point behind, all over delta x squared. By the way, this formula is derived from Taylor formulas, Taylor series, essentially. And it's very close to the first derivative formula. The first derivative formula basically is the following. If you wanted to find the first derivative function, it's point in front minus point behind all over 2 delta x. If you don't, that is a slope formula. Rise over run. What you do is now you're taking two derivatives. So it's like a slope of a slope. That's what you get. There's the discretization. So it tells you if I'm going to have an image, I use my neighboring points to calculate the second derivative. So this is how I think about it in a computational domain. And how would you actually set this up in MATLAB to solve? Well, we have this domain. Point over here, let's start solving from negative L to L. And U at negative L, we'll call that U1. U at negative L plus dx, that's the second pixel point, is u2, all the way down to u at L, which is u of n plus 1. Now I'm trying to, you know, that's what I have. I have some u over this domain. Here's how I do it. And so I'm going to define a vector, a vector u, which is just a collection of the u values at all my points. So let's make this u of n. Okay. 
So when I do a diffusion equation, this is going to be equivalent to the following. Uh, that's what it's equivalent to. I'm going to take my U field, discretize it to a bunch of points, and I want to care, I care about what happens at every point under diffusion. It's equal to UXX. Well, what does UXX do? Well, what UXX is is a second derivative, and it tells me how, if I'm a point, I connect to my neighbors. Here it is. If I'm at this point, I connect to my two neighbors. Point in front, point behind, twice of my current point over delta x squared. Oh, so let's just, I don't need that k there. So there's the delta x squared. And the matrix A carries the information about the second derivative. What does the matrix A look like? Well, the matrix A tells me how I relate to my neighbors. And so the matrix A looks like this. Zeros everywhere. Negative 2 down the diagonal. One ones on the off diagonal. Good? All right. So if I build that matrix, this is now an ODE solve. Okay. So this is a, just a giant system of linear ODEs. I can use a command called OD45 in MATLAB. Many of you are familiar with that one. If you're not, we're going to do it right now. And you're going to just diffuse this problem, as it were. <laughs> All right. How do you take this into two dimensions? Well, to two dimensions, it's not that much harder. Uh, conceptually, it's the same idea. Conceptually, what you're doing in two dimensions is saying, all right, I have ut is equal to like this. And if I'm on a domain, now if I look at a point here, I have some grid of pixels. And I'm at this point here, and I ask the following. What's it mean to have uxx? What's it mean to have uyy? Well, those second derivative formulas still hold. They're just ones in the x direction, ones in the y direction. So in the x direction, this point relies on those two neighbors. In the y direction, it relies on those two neighbors. So ultimately, this problem here just also decomposes into a big ODE problem. Where if we define u of n m, make sure I'm consistent with my notes, is equal to, I'm at the x of nth position, x of mth, sorry, y sub m. Okay, so I go to n m and I ask, what is the equation there? And what I need to do now is stack all this data. I need to keep track of every single point on this domain. So instead of just being n points, it's n times m points. And so let's make a vector u. u will be equal to the following. u11, u12, u1n, uh, u21, all the way to u of uh, n m. So you basically take all these points and you stack them up into a big vector. You're arranging, you're collecting all your data. And this thing here is going to be given basically by the following. Conceptually, that's all that you've done. Same thing as before. You just generalize 2D, except now you is a really big vector. And this matrix A is a n by m times n by m matrix. It's big. Okay, so if I chop this up into 100 points, if I have 100 pixels this way and 100 pixels this way, right, then this, so it's 10 to the 2 in size, then that vector is 10 to the 4 in size. So it's 10,000 by 10,000, and, and this, so 10,000 by 1 vector. And this matrix A is a 10,000 by 10,000 matrix. It's huge. Okay? But this matrix, we have to figure out how to construct it. And once we construct it, then we're, we're good. That's all we need. And once we have that, they just throw that into OD45. OD45, all it cares about is this. You define me the initial condition, stack it, and if you give me A right, I'm done. Okay. 
So we're going to talk about doing that, and we'll do it in our code. Okay? Everybody good so far? So those of you who had 581 from last quarter, you're like, oh, I could bust this out in my sleep. Right? Sleep, maybe. maybe OK, maybe you have to be partially awake. Maybe you have to refer to your notes. But anyway, pretty close. That's almost asleep. All right, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to give you the algorithm right now. We're going to talk about it, how to construct this in two dimensions. And mostly the idea is to show you the concept of how to do the, the image processing with the diffusion. OK? All right, so that's what we're after. Take an image, diffuse it. We're going to do the very simplest diffusion. But keep in mind that the diffusion process has a much bigger picture in mind, which is the potential for doing non-constant coefficient diffusion and nonlinear diffusion, which gives you the flexibility of potentially doing much more interesting things. All right, so now we go program a little MATLAB. By the way, let's do a little calculation in our heads here. Ready? You have an image, 600 by 800. OK, that's a lot of points. How many points is that? 48,000. OK, uh, so what's that size of that matrix A for that image? 48,000 by 48,000. I don't know, it's pretty big. Does that sound pretty big to you? I mean, you're probably, nobody's going to ask you in class, hey, could you diagonalize this by hand? No, probably you weren't going to do that. OK, find me some mind. You know, you do that with 2 by 2s, 3 by 3s. Now you got a 48,000 by 48,000. It's a big matrix. So we're going to do a smaller image because uh, I got all time to sit here lecturing all day and uh, you know, run this code that takes forever. I got, I got busy things to do. Okay, so we're going to do a smaller image so that we can actually make this a little more manageable. But realize that very quickly, if you have a high quality image, it's not like, oh, just press go, it's done. It's like you're doing a pretty serious size computation at that point. So you better be committed to it. All right, so here we go. Let me go to my other little screen here. Uh, boom. Boom. Whoa, green screen. Oh. OK, good. All right. Dang, I got the whoa right away. I, didn't have, I, I knew problems were up right away. All right. Was that? You could see it there, too? Were you scared? Dang, well, I'm sorry. I ho hope you're OK. Take some deep breaths. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, here's my little code, the little starter piece. I'm going to read in an image that has a much lower resolution. Uh, I'm going to first convert it to a, a black and white, so an RGB cube to gray. And then I'm going to change the file format to a double precision number so I can use all my matrix manipulations and things on it. Uh, I'm going to cal calculate the size of that image. Okay? So it's an NX by NY. So that's the number of pixels in X, number of pixels in Y. I'm going to noise it. Noise is a random variable, normally distributed. And then once I do it, I create this thing here, U2. And U2, I add the noise with some strength. And then I convert it back with uint 8 to an image file, essentially. And I plot the original image and its black and white version. And I draw now. OK, so let's load in our, load in our image. There we go. <laughs> this is our uh, test image. <laughs> uh, Derek Zoolander. You can see there on the left the perfect image of Derek Zoolander with blue steel. And on the right, ugly protesters have thrown noise on him. And it's our task to denoise this. Uh, did you not see that on the prereqs that watching this movie Zoolander was required for the course? Because if you haven't had it, you're going to really struggle with this class. Okay, so I would suggest you rent that over the weekend just in case you haven't seen it yet. Or I haven't seen it recently, really. I mean, we could just start with that. If you haven't seen it in the last six months, maybe go rent it. All right, there we go. So we are trying to smooth that image out. You can see Derek has got a little lines here and there. His hair not as cool as it used to be. So we want to take this as a, uh, an example file that we're going to try to smooth out by basically 
applying the heat equation to Derek's face. Okay. All right. It's kind of like a treatment. All right. So there we go. I'm glad everybody's impressed with my image selection. And let's be honest. Do you know why I picked this image? Oh, well, of course, I love Derek Zoolander, but who doesn't? Uh, but NX by NY, it's an image that's 200 by 184. And if you remember, my coffee cup was 600 by 800. And that takes a long time to diffuse. Okay, but this is a much, this kind of like gets out results pretty quick. So I was looking for a smaller image and I was inspired. There we go. All right. I know right now many of you are thinking, wow, I'm not as beautiful as Derek. It's okay. No anyway, he's, he's a supermodel. It's, you shouldn't feel, I didn't, my purpose in showing that wasn't for you to feel insecure today. I just want to put that out there. You're all beautiful. All right, so what are we going to do with this thing? So first of all, to diffuse it, we got to build this uh, matrix operator where we're going to go ahead and take this thing and uh, define a space with a number of points. And so let's define an X domain. And we're going to just completely make this up, a linear space. It's going to go from 0 to 1 in NX points. So we already know there's NX points. All we're doing now is putting an X scale in the X direction of Derek. And we're also going to do this in Y. It's a linear space from 0 to 1 in NY points. So in other words, we're making some X and Y variables so we can do a grid. Now the DX values are, because we're going to need that for our heat operator, is X2 minus X1. And DY is equal to Y2 minus Y1. So now we have an X domain, a Y domain defined. Uh, we're pretty much uh, in good shape. Now what about, we need derivatives. So that's the next piece. Now what we know is for the x derivative, it's a point in front, point behind, minus twice the current point. That was the formula I gave for the slope. So we're going to do that here. And first, of all, so, for, so far right now, this problem has no idea about directionality. It does not know there's an x direction. It does not know there's a y direction. x and y are simply vectors I made up. We'll get to that point in a moment. But for right now, there's no sense of direction. There's just simply these vectors. And let's make up the dx, the x derivative operator. So first of all, this matrix is mostly empty. There's negative 2 down the diagonal and 1's on the off diagonal. Everything else is 0. So it's what's called sparse. So we're going to use what's called sparse spdiags command. Okay. Now, SP diags is for sparse matrices. What we want to do with this SP diags uh, is the following. We have to put ones on it, and let's, let's make up a vector of ones. Let's call it 1x is going to be a vector of ones that is size nx by 1. And what we're going to do with this is we're going to put 1x minus 2, 1x, and 1x. So that's ones, negative twos, ones. And where are we going to put them? At the locations, negative 1, 0, 1. So the 0 point is the main diagonal. 1 is 1 to the right of the diagonal. Negative 1 is 1 left of the diagonal. And so what this tells you is put this vector of 1s, negative 2s, and 1s at the locations, 1 below the diagonal, on the diagonal, and 1 above the diagonal. That's exactly what that matrix looks like. And this matrix size is going to be nx by nx. OK. The only other thing we need with this, the x derivative has a 1 over dx squared under it, right? So we can just take this thing, divide by dx squared. There is your two derivatives in x and y. Sorry, two derivatives in x. Let's build the same thing for y. So we'll make one y, and this is and y by 1 and y, y, y. And then you put a y here. Okay. So in other words, we do not have to have x and y discretized the same way. It's a 200 by 184 image. So they're different in each direction. And so I've just built uh, two matrices, one that takes two derivatives in x, one that takes two derivatives from y. Now, by the way, remember, this still does not know that they are the x and y directions. 
Okay? We're going to teach it now. You ready to teach? That's what you're doing in MATLAB. You're teaching this thing how to behave. Two derivatives of x and y is called the Laplacian. Call that L. And before we get carried away with L, we need one or two matrices. I need a matrix of the I need the identity matrix in X in the X direction, and I need a identity matrix in the Y direction. So this is called let's call it IX is equal to I. It's the identity matrix and X. IY is, is the identity matrix and Y. By the way, this, this program, I'm not, uh, this is just an illustration. We're not going to focus a lot on going down the diffusion route unless you want to do something in your final projects along this line. So it's okay if you're a little bit, whoa, we're releasing a lot of high commands. That's fine. Just, you'll have this on the notes. And the point is that this is just one aspect we want to teach. We're moving on to other stuff next week. Okay? But I just want to educate you a little bit. Now, let's teach it dimensionality. Uh, in particular, we're going to make it be uh, two-dimensional by the following command. Command to make it two-dimensional, or to make this huge matrix. So right now, these are nx by nx and ny by an ny matrices. And what we need is this big matrix, what we call A over there, which is, if you chop it up 100 points this way and 100 points this way, that thing becomes a 10,000 by 10,000. That's the two-dimensional version. And this is what this L is. And what it is, is use the cron command. Cron, super awesome. That's right, Maria, getting a smile from Maria. Woo, she knows cron. And then you, here you go. And this is the way cron works. There it is, simple as that. You went two dimensional. This is the power of MATLAB ultimately. Fairly simple code structure. I just build a two-dimensional, I'm going to basically build a two-dimensional PDE solve within very few lines of code, very rapidly. I don't have to worry about what does this thing look like. That does it all for me. Super sweet. Okay? So the cron command says, this is like the x location, this is the y location. So take two derivatives in x, nothing in y, plus nothing in x, two derivatives in y. And then build this thing up where you know that x and y now represent the x direction and the y direction. And L is going to come out to be this massive matrix. It's sparse. And that takes the two derivatives in x and y that we need. Okay? That's the basis for the whole thing. All right. So we're ready. All we need is an initial condition. And what is the initial condition? The best five syllables in male modeling, Derek Zoolander. Okay, come on. You guys seriously got to watch that movie again sometime soon. He, you know, he was counting that at the, and, you know. Do you remember that scene? He's counting, is it five syllables? Derek Zuman, he's counting them out. No? Okay, anyway. Maybe it's a refresher for everybody. All right, so what do we want to do with this? Now, what we're going to do is say, I have an initial condition. And uh, the thing about the initial condition we have, it's, uh, let's call it U3. U3 is this black and white image that we had, and I add this noise to it. If you remember before, what I did is I, I defined this thing called U2, but right away I, I converted it back into, into the image, uh, image format. So U3 is just basically the same thing, uh, but it's, it's, it's just we're going to keep it U3 in, in data, profile, data format so we can actually do simulations on it. So U3 right now is our image in, in P colored, essentially, if you want to think about it that way. And we have to reshape it. Here's how you do it. We're going to make a new vector, U3, 2. So we're going to make it, a, it's, this, it's just going to be reshape that thing, U3 into an, an x by n times ny by 1. It's going to reshape it into a big column vector. And now what we're ready to do is just call OD45. And this is going to diffuse the whole problem for us. And the way OD45 works, we call some right-hand side. You could say OD45. You call some right-hand side. Let's call it image right-hand side. You tend to send in your T-span. We'll talk about T-span in a moment. You send in your initial condition. 
any other kind of uh, resolution things, like you want to have a certain um, tolerance or accuracy, you can send it in there. But if we're just going to use the default, you send, send it in as open bars. Your L matrix and your diffusion coefficient. We haven't defined a diffusion coefficient. Let's just make it here. Uh, I want it to be small, actually. Let's start off very small, like that. And for time span, I also want it to be small. I'll show you why, because you'll see that it, it, you don't have to diffuse for very much, and it will. You remember if in the image cleanup we did for the cup, we wanted a very broad filter. That's essentially equivalent to saying I want very small time, very small diffusion. Okay? Otherwise, it becomes like that, what we did also in the Gaussian filter, which if you make your filter really narrow, it just blurs out the whole image. You've got nothing left. Okay? So what we're going to do is do a T-span, 0, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06. Those are going to be the values. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically watch this. We're going to say, take this stuff in, diffuse this image, give me back the, the results of this diffusion process at time 0, which is the initial image, at time 0 0.002, at time 0 0.004, at time 0 0.006. Kick it all out to me, and let's plot that up and see what we get to see what it looks like. OK, so here's the figure we want to plot. Uh, actually, I'm not plotting any figures, so we just say, let's do a loop. There's four images coming out for j equals 1 to uh, length of this t-span. And what we're going to do is, first of all, we're going to pull image by image out. So every, see this y here? Every row of y is my data in this format where it's nx times ny long. And what I have to first do is take this thing and reshape it back if I want to plot it. And then once I reshape it back, I can plot this thing. OK, so first of all, let's go ahead through this loop and say, all right, let's, take, uh, let's, take, let's reshape the jth row of this thing. So I'm going to grab the jth row, and we're going to reshape it back into an nx by ny. That's what our image was. Okay. But I don't want to just reshape it. Let's also convert it back to image format. So I'll just say, let's go like this and say, OK, I want the u int 8 of that. And let's call this a right, smooth. OK, that's my smoothed image. All right. I'm going to make your eye contact. I got you. OK. All right. Everybody, that's my smoothed image. Now that I have it, I can, uh, I can actually plot this thing. I can say, OK, subplot 2, 2, j. And what I do in this is say, image show abw smooth. By the way, you might want to put some uh, semicolons around here. It's going to slow it down. That's it, except for image right-hand side. By the way, I already built it. Uh, oh, no. File, open. What did I call it again? Uh, image right hand side. There it is. Here's what happens in the image right hand side. That's it. Diffusion operator, two derivatives in x and y, initial condition, and just runs it through. That's all you need. Remember, when you solve these things, all it does is turns it into a giant set of ODEs. That's that's the whole right-hand side. So that's what it iterates on. Okay? So we have the right-hand side. You bring in your time, your initial condition. This tends to be the settings for the tolerances. You don't just leave it alone. Call it a dummy variable. L and D come in. Pop in here. You're good. You're ready to roll with this thing. Okay? So let's try it out. Let's smooth out the image here. And if we run this thing then, we can kind of go boom. It's running. See, it's busy. Now, we'll see how well this actually does in the projector, because it's uh, kind of hard. Can you get, oh. There we go. It's blue steel smoothed over. All right. All right. So let's take a look at this image. Here's the original one with some noise we added onto it. It's a little bit grainier. Uh, I don't know how well you guys can see the difference, but as you go from here, as you diffuse it, it basically smooths 
out some of this patchiness. It looks like dry skin. Maybe you could smooth it out because moisture is the essence of beauty. And there we go. We smooth it out. So we got beautiful Derek Zoolander here. By the way, if you, keep, oh, if you keep smoothing this thing, what will happen is you start actually creating actually problems. The one big problem in smoothing with diffusion is knowing when to stop. Okay? If you over smooth, you wipe out a lot of stuff you want. There, and the stopping time to, to, for this thing is not clear. It's kind of by trial and error, right? So the big thing is you want to smooth. And the thing is, you want to actually develop a very robust algorithm so that you don't have to look at all the image and say, oh, that's probably the best. For this image, the time to stop the smoothing is here. For this image, it's here. You would like to develop a way to say, I can run any photo through it, and I've got a pretty good optimal time to stop the diffusion process before it starts ruining the image. So there you go, diffusion and smoothness. Have a wonderful weekend. And see you guys Monday.